For those that would like to follow along with the sermon outline, it is uh, right there. There's a QR code uh, behind me. But Matthew chapter 28, beginning in the first verse, it says, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him, lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy, and did run to bring his disciples' word. And as they sat to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid. Go tell my brother that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, as we continue this time of Easter worship, we sing hallelujah for the one who died for me. We remember that our salvation is in Christ alone. And so God, as we turn to your word, would you give us ears to hear hearts to receive the truth of your word. Would you draw every heart in this room and watching online to yourself. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. And you may be seated. The resurrection changes everything. That's what we want to see this morning in Bill Moyer's book, A World of Ideas, the second Jacob Needleman remembers, and some of you may even remember this, quote, I was an observer at the launch of Apollo 17 in 1975. It was a night launch, and there were hundreds of cynical reporters all over the lawn, drinking beer, wisecracking, and waiting for this 35-story high rocket. The countdown came, and then the launch. The first thing you see is this extraordinary orange light which is just at the limit of what you can bear to look at. Everything is illuminated with this light. Then comes this thing slowly rising up in total silence because it takes a few seconds for the sound to come across. And you hear this whoosh. It enters into you. You can practically hear jaws dropping. The sense of wonder fills everyone in the whole place as this thing goes up and up. The first stage ignites this beautiful blue flame it becomes like a star, but then you realize humans are on it. And then there was total silence, end quote. Now, if you have ever seen a shuttle take off, it, there are certain events in our minds that are forever etched in our brains as to where we were. Events such as when JFK was assassinated. Where were you when there was an attempted assassination on Ronald Reagan? Where were you when you heard that the first man had stepped onto the moon? Where were you on September 11th, 2001? There are all of these events that the mere mention of a date or just a little bit of the story ignites all of these memories. Some of them good, some of them not. But I want you to imagine for a moment, what would it have been like to observe the resurrection of Jesus Christ? You want to know the interesting thing? If you read all through the scriptures, we don't get a detailed account of Jesus actually rising from the dead. What we see in the end of the Gospels is the fact that the tomb is already empty. He's already risen. There were no eyewitnesses to this account, and yet what we see is that the resurrection changes everything. There is no greater human event in all of history 
than the Son of God dying in our place and three days later rising from the dead. Because of that death, burial, and resurrection, your life and my life are forever changed. Whether you are a Christian or not, your life was changed that day as well. Here's the one big thing for this morning. The resurrection changes everything, and here's been the theme all morning, and gives us hope. You know, you think about all of the, the headlines that have been going on in these weeks leading up to Easter. And you think about how crazy and maddening the world has become. They are starving for hope. In church, we've got that message of hope. But there's three facts about this resurrection that we need to understand. The first is this, that it was unexpected. Now, we don't know why Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to the tomb. We assume it was to anoint the body of Jesus because uh, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, they kind of had to do it in a hurry on the day that Jesus died because it was just about sundown and, and so the Sabbath was starting. And so maybe they were going there to anoint and finish the, the job. Maybe they were just going there to remember Jesus and, and to mourn. Chances are, uh, every one of us, you know there's either a family or a close friend who has passed away and you've probably gone back to the cemetery and, and just kind of been there and you've remembered them and you've mourned it. So maybe that's what they're doing. Either way, does it really matter? Because they were expecting the body to be there. They watched Jesus die just three days earlier. They saw what Pilate did and the Roman guards did and, and all of that. They were expecting a body. Now, let's, let's not be too hard on these, these ladies and even the disciples later. Because how many people do you know who have died, been dead for three days, and then all of a sudden they're walking and talking again? You and I have the benefit of hindsight. We know how the story ends. They were living it out in real time. So let's understand that they were just going based off of what their life had always shown them. Someone dies, that's it. That's the end of the story. It's also easy for us to forget things in our grief. How often when... Something hasn't gone our way and it breaks our heart. How many times have we forgot the goodness and the mercy and even the promises of God ourselves? So it's understandable to a degree. Yes, they should have known that Jesus told his disciples three different times he was going to rise from the dead. And they believed in a resurrection. If you go to John chapter 11, when Jesus' friend Lazarus dies, Remember, Jesus says, your brother will rise again. And, and what does Mary say? I know my brother will rise again on the last day. See, they didn't understand that Jesus wasn't talking about at the end of time. He's saying, I'm going to die and I'm going to rise from the dead three days later. It's coming here now. In their minds, this rabbi that they loved and had followed for three years just died and they didn't understand they thought he was the the promised messiah the one they were looking for so how if he is really the one who was to come then how could god let him die so the resurrection is unexpected but you know what else it is it is also verified we see there in verses two through six Jesus had told his disciples three different times he was going to be betrayed, he was going to be crucified, and he was going to rise from the dead. That's why the angel says he is not here for he is risen, just as he said. It was an act of reminding them of Jesus' words because in their grief they had forgotten them. But let me ask you, so again, he says I'm going to be betrayed, I'm going to be crucified, and I'm going to rise from the dead. So if the first two things happen, shouldn't we have trusted the third thing was also going to happen? 
But again, when, you, when we rely on human wisdom and logic, we miss the work and power of God. How many promises have the, has the Bible made to you, but you struggle to remember? There are probably Christians here, probably those watching, who there have been days where they have just royally blown it. And they have forgotten that God still loves them. That they still stand forgiven by God. That they still have peace with God because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. How many times have you found yourself in a situation in which you feel all alone? Even though we know the Bible says that God has promised, though you walk through the fire or go through the waters, I will be with you. Even though it says, I will never leave you or forsake you. How many times have we forgotten the promises of God? I'll tell you, every time you and I trust our feelings and our emotions, we forget the promises. Listen, it's good to feel feelings. There's a, there, there's a really tiny baby here this morning. And, and just seeing baby Atlas and man, grandma and grandpa, they're sitting up straight and proud now, right? But, but every one of you has ever experienced it. Like as soon as you see somebody else's baby, you can remember to that first time you laid eyes on that child and the first time you, you held her, him or her in your arms. And you love them. But that feeling sometimes wavers a little bit, doesn't it? When you've gone six months and you haven't gotten more than three hours of sleep at night, you are going, how can something so cute be so evil? But you know your baby's not evil. It's normal. But when we trust our feelings and emotions, we forget the promises of God. It's okay to feel the feelings, just don't trust your feelings. Because they're 90% wrong. We can see here all of this happening to prove who Jesus was, but also to strengthen the faith of the disciples for the mission that was ahead of them. And that's the exact same thing for you and I. Now, why was that stone rolled away from the tomb? It wasn't to let Jesus out. He's already gone. It was there to let the women, later on Peter and John, and you and I to look in and go, he is not here for he is risen just as he said. It was a call by God to say, you can trust me. Everything I've promised, everything I've said has come to pass. You can trust me. Isn't it interesting that the one undisputed fact of this story is that the tomb was empty? The women saw it. Later, Peter and John saw it. Even the guards who were there, who were not Christian, even they knew that the tomb was empty. It's why they had to go run into Pilate because they're terrified for their life. They had one job, guard the tomb, make sure nothing happens to that body because we don't want a deception to be uh, perpetuated. And yet, the stone is rolled away. They can see in, there is no body. So they run to Pilate and Pilate says, do me a favor. The, the chief priest, excuse me, they ran to the chief priest. And the chief priest said, just do me a favor. Tell the people that the disciples stole his body. And if word gets back to the governor, we're going to protect you. Now, think about how ridiculous that lie was. There was a seal put on that, that stone. If somebody came and rolled that stone away, by the way, that was one of the problems the women encountered as they were walking if you read in the other gospels they're going how are we going to move that stone but if they were to move that stone what would have been broken the seal and if the seal wasn't broken 
So even the lie meant to, to cover it up was an absolute joke. Later on, Jesus has 10 resurrection appearances over the course of 40 days. Five of them he makes on this first, what we call, Easter day. Then Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 writes that Jesus appeared to more than 500 of his disciples at once. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is easily one of the most verifiable facts in all of human history. You can deny it. You could try to explain it away. But the bottom line is you can go to the Holy Land even now and you will find an empty garden tomb. The resurrection is verified, but why does this matter? Because of this. The resurrection is life-changing. By Jesus' death, God's wrath against our sin was satisfied and it was paid in full. That's one thing I, I love about the song we sang this morning, Simply Broken. Because there's a line in the verse that says that you prove that God is love and God is just. Because he is a holy God, our sin is offensive to God. We see all through the Old Testament, even through the New Testament, someone has to pay for that sin. And it was either going to be Jesus on the cross or it will be you in your rebellion and your rejection of Christ. If Jesus wasn't God, then why would the Holy Spirit raise him from the dead? Wouldn't that be perpetuating a lie? But the very fact that Jesus was raised by the power of the Spirit proves that his sacrifice satisfied his father. His father was pleased with the obedience of his son. Which means this, we can be forgiven. Some of you here this morning, some of you watching online may have think I've messed up way too much. Maybe God can love those people. Maybe God can forgive that other person. But I have messed my life up so bad, there's no possible way God could love me. Listen, if you're here, you're watching, and that's where you're thinking, I want you to hear what Scripture says to you. Romans 5, 20. Where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. What does that mean? It means the depth of our sin is so great that we could never reach the bottom of our sin sick and depraved heart on our own. But the good news is God's grace is so abundant that it is higher and deeper than even our sin. Grace abounds more than your sin. And that's reason to celebrate. That's reason to praise God and thank him for that gift. There's a there's a hymn that we sing from time to time that says, There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day, and there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. Listen, regardless of where you've gone, regardless of what you have done, if God is calling out to you and drawing you with the truth of the gospel, then you have not gone too far. You can be forgiven and you can be saved today. This is the message of the hope that the world must hear, church. By Jesus' death and resurrection, we can be saved. On the day of his death, there was an earthquake and the veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom. There's so much symbolism in that. It was torn from top to bottom showing that only God could do it. Salvation only comes from God. It is the Father's plan accomplished by the Son and confirmed by the Spirit. The only thing you and I contributed to our salvation was the sin that made it necessary. That's why we can't take any credit for it. It's not that I have ever or would ever choose God. It is rather that God in his love and grace chose us. And because of that, it, it, it's showing us 
who God is. The curtain that separated the holy place from the most holy place would have been at least 14 feet high. Now, there's some pretty tall people in this room. I don't think you can stand on your tiptoes and reach 14 feet. It would have been really thick at the top. So how are you going to rip it? It is showing us that it is only by God's grace through Jesus' blood that you and I can be forgiven and saved. And that is exactly what God in his grace has done. Not only this, but Jesus' resurrection means this. We can have hope. Uh, in the 1950s, there was a devastating earthquake in China. As a result of this earthquake, a huge boulder was dislodged from the mountain, thus exposing a, a cache of wonderful artifacts from a thousand years ago. A new world, as, as a result of that earthquake, became visible. Well, you know what? When the stone was rolled away there in Jerusalem, that entombed Jesus and the earth shook, we got our first glimpse of a brand new world, a world where death no longer has the last word, where injustice will be made right, where innocent suffering is vindicated by the intrusion of a powerful God. In other words, there is a better day coming. We look at the world and we cry out as they did in the Old Testament. How long, O oh Lord, are you going to put up with this? How long will you allow humanity to shake their fist and turn their nose up at you? And I say this, he will do it as long as he is determined because of his act of grace and mercy towards us. While we as Christians pray, come Lord Jesus, come quickly, we also praise his name that he hasn't returned. Because we do believe this, that when Jesus returns, the time for repentance and faith is over. And the eternity is sealed forever. So while we look and we long, church, for Jesus to come... We praise him that he is giving our friends and our family and our neighbors and our co-workers just a little bit more time. You see, from the time of Adam and Eve's sin in the garden, death has reigned over us all. In the medical field, there have been some incredible breakthroughs, haven't there? Yo, know, just 50 years ago, if you heard the word cancer, it was a death sentence. Now, not as much. All of these advances, but you know what science and medicine have not been able to prevent? Death. Here's the thing. You and I are living longer, but just delaying the inevitable. Death is a reality, yet in a moment, sin had been paid for, God's wrath had been satisfied, and three days later, death's hold on us was broken. We now live in a world where we no longer have to fear death, but we can celebrate it, and we can look forward to it because of the resurrection. Because we have this promise that just as Jesus rose from the dead, so too one day will we rise from the dead. And we will be with him for all of eternity. We know that there's something greater coming because of his resurrection. On the cross, the world did all it could to Jesus. At Easter, God did all he could to show the world his love and the hope that he offers. You no longer have to fear death, but rather can embrace it. You can actually die to yourself today so that you would be alive for Jesus, not only now, but for all of eternity. We talk about, and Scripture mentions, that Jesus gives us eternal life. And we think, well, that, that's something in the future. No, no, no. Eternal life begins the moment you surrender to Jesus. Eternal life is that moment in which you are given peace with God. And that never changes. 
you can experience eternal life now. Not just wait on it. The message of Christianity is not surrender to Jesus and then come to church and sit sour and soak and wait till the day you die. No, no, no. The message of Christianity is come to Jesus, die to yourself, that you may live now and forever in a right relationship with him. This is the hope that he is offering. It is the hope that we can speak to those families who lose children. It is the hope that we can take to places like Nashville. It is the hope that we can take when a loved one of ours dies or when we lose our job or everything is falling apart because what Jesus offers us can never be taken from us by anything or anyone in this world. That is the hope of the resurrection. That Satan, you can do whatever you want to me. If God permits Satan, he can treat me like Job. But you know what he can't take? He cannot take my life because that is hidden in Christ. Are you living with that hope today? Do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that no matter what happens today or tomorrow, it is well with my soul? It's one of the most beautiful hymns ever written. And, and we sing it often. But my guess is we don't know the story behind it. So if you'll permit me to tell a little story. Horatio Spafford wrote the words. He was a wealthy businessman in Chicago. He and his family were getting ready to board a ship. And they were going to go from New York over to England. But urgent business came up at the last moment. And so Spafford sent his wife and children ahead. He said, I'll get the next one. I'll see you in a few days. While they were crossing the Atlantic, a storm came up and sunk the ship. Only his wife and one of their children survived. When they made it over to England, they got a telegram back over to Horatio and, and said what had happened. And so when he opens that hymn, talking about when sea billows roll, he's writing those words as he's crossing the Atlantic, knowing that when he gets to the other side, he is not going to see his entire family. He would have to cross the same ocean where just days before, much of his family perished. And yet he says, I have this hope. That you have taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Do you have that hope this morning? The resurrection of Jesus also proves that Jesus is exactly who he said he was. Everything Jesus said would happen actually happened. He said, I am God and I am Lord, and the resurrection proved it. That's why there in verse 18 of Matthew 28, he begins what we call the, the Great Commission with this. All authority is given unto me in heaven and on earth. If your name is not the sovereign God and the Lord of all, you can't make that, that claim. But his resurrection proved who he is. There is literally no one more powerful than Jesus. What this ultimately means for you and I today is this, because Jesus is who he said he is, and because he did what he said he was going to do, you and I are accountable to him, just like he said. That there is a day affixed, known only to God, in which we will see him face to face, and we will give an account for our life, and that account will either go, Jesus paid it all, or I have to start paying it myself. These are the options. Because Jesus is God and Lord, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess these truths. The only question for us is this. Will we do it now willingly as an act of worship? Or will we do it on the day that he returns when we are forced to acknowledge who he is and forced to acknowledge that we deserve his judgment? 
But make no mistakes about it. We will recognize who he is. And we will bow to him. His resurrection also means this. Our life has meaning and a purpose bigger than ourselves. But not just you individually. Us collectively as the church. Notice the angel tells the women to run and tell the disciples, meet Jesus in Galilee. Have you ever wondered why Galilee? Kind of interesting. See, Galilee was the furthest you could go and still be in Israel. If you left Galilee, you were now in Gentile territory. You were now in hostile territory. So Jesus takes them to the edge of the promised land. And he's looking out into these distant lands that are far from God. And he says, all authority is given me in heaven and earth. Go there. And make disciples of all nations. Baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The journey of faith for the disciples didn't end on Easter Sunday morning at a garden tomb or even in Galilee. Their mission continued to the ends of the earth. And our mission is the exact same. We're going to pick it up next week, Lord willing. We're going to spend the next six weeks looking through the first nine chapters of Acts. Why? Because the journey continues. Our journey didn't end the day that you, that you surrendered to Jesus. That was the day your journey began. The journey isn't uh, just about, let me know a lot of facts about Jesus. It's not just surrender to him in faith and then wait to go to heaven one day. As Pastor Robbie Gallaty says, quote, the gospel came to you on its way to somebody else. And so church, I ask you this question, who's your one? Who's the family member? Who's the friend? Who's the co-worker that you know this morning right now does not have a relationship with Jesus Christ? That if they were to die before that moment, that they would be eternally separated from him. You want to know why God didn't take you home the moment you surrendered to him? That's your reason. It's to glorify him by making disciples of all nations. We've got our little who's your one aquarium out there. The white ping pong balls represent the names that we're praying for. So if you haven't added a name, I encourage you on your way out, grab a white ping pong ball. There's Sharpies out there. Write the name, the first name of somebody that you know isn't saved and put it in there. And here's your commitment in doing that. I'm going to pray for them every single day until either they surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ or one of us passes away. The yellow ones are our commitment that we're going to share the gospel with them. Because we know this, God has promised to save some. Aren't you glad of that? That our evangelism isn't in vain. Yes, non-straight people may tell us no, but maybe that tenth one, maybe God's been drawing them that entire time. And the moment you share the gospel, they respond to him. Who's your one? If you're here today, you're watching online, and you were saved, you have been saved for a purpose. It is a purpose that is bigger than you. It is a purpose that glorifies God by you and I going out and making disciples of all nations. It's why we have said as our church, our vision is to know God deeply so that we can make him known broadly. That's why we exist. We don't exist to create ministries and see how many people we can get in, into a service. The success of a service is not by how many people come in, but by how many people we equip and commission to go out. Are you living on purpose? Or are you just wasting your time? And it's easy. It's easy to, to get bogged down by, by life. I mean, you, you, you got your marriage. It needs attention. You got your children. They need a lot of attention and direction. You got your job. 
You, you got all of these things that are pulling at you. But what we want to understand is this, that it's not choosing those things or Jesus, but rather it is applying the gospel to every one of those situations. I have to apply the gospel to my marriage. I have to apply the gospel to my family. I have to apply the gospel to my job. It's a little bit easier for me. Um, but you have to apply the gospel to your job. you got to understand that when you get up and, and, and you're exhausted tomorrow morning because it's been a really long day on Sunday, that when you go to your work, you're not going there to please your boss. You're not going there to get a paycheck so you can pay your bills and, and afford the things you have. You have been placed there by a sovereign God in the path of somebody who needs to see, hear, and experience his love. That's what it means to live on mission. It means to be a, a disciple. And so the question of the hour for us is simply this. Where are you on your journey with Jesus? The reality is some of you may not have even begun your journey yet. To that, Jesus says this. Come. You know, he, he was talking to Matthew 11 to the Jews. And the Jews had the law, and their whole life was about keeping the law. Let me put it in 2023 terms. Maybe your entire life has been, I'm going to go to church because that's what I'm supposed to do. I'm going to get baptized because that's what I'm supposed to do. I want to join a church because that's what I'm supposed to do. To you, I say not a single one of those things saved you. Only the grace of God saves us. Have you surrendered to him? Which means, have you repented of your sin? That means I'm no longer going to choose to live for myself, but I'm going to understand that Jesus died in my place, and I'm trusting him entirely. That's the invitation, to turn from your rebellion and turn in faith, knowing this, all that the Father has given me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Man, what a promise from God. Everybody who's supposed to come is going to come, and, and if you're coming, Jesus is never going to say, nope, not you. If you're coming, it's because he is talking to you he is convicting you and drawing you and so you just come on to jesus but to my brothers and my sisters in christ i want us to ask this are we wasting our life by ignoring our growth are we using the life that god has given us to make much of him so what's your next step Let's take it together this morning. Would you stand with me as we're going to pray?